Well, Li Dunbai Tongzhi, 欢迎你。谢谢。我们打破规则，好不好啊？可以，可以。说中文可以吗？呃，可以说。哎 ，Today you can't talk Chinese and then hard. Sorry. Well, let me.、Um, you saw a little bit of the trailer of a of a of a, a film, a documentary film that was produced about Sydney's life called The Revolutionary, which will be premiering in Seattle at the Seattle International Film Festival later this in, in May, the end of May.、Uh, but、um, We thought we'd just、uh, play a little bit of a Barbara Walters kind of interview here, and、uh, I'll just talk to Sydney about some of the key events in his very, very interesting life. You look As... just like her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> made my day, Sydney.、Um, and、uh, and how you made decisions at those decision points? What were the consequences of those decisions? And I, I think it's safe to say that you have been a lifelong rule bender. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I thought it'd be a lot of fun to get you here. So here you are, looking I, I think much like Douglas Fairbanks Jr. There, that's a pretty interesting shot from you at Stanford University when you first decided that you wanted to study Chinese, not Japanese.、Mm -hmm. And wh how how did that come about? What was that? What was the reason for that? Well, I was actually selected out of the infantry right here in Oregon to go to Stanford and be trained in Japanese. And after the war, to be in military government in Japan. So this was spring 1943, and one everybody said wonderful opportunity, wonderful career. And I thought, uh uh. First of all, military government didn't interest me. Even more important, I wanted to come back home right after the war, and I figured if I Get stuck in Japan, it'll be years. So I talked myself out of Japanese into Chinese because China was an ally. War ends, you come home. And this choice showed a real gift of prophecy, which <laughs> has been with me my whole life. Because in only 35 years, I was back home. <laughs> <laughs> Made a wrong turn or two. I made the right turn, yeah, the right <laughs> but turn. I didn't yeah. know it. Yeah, yeah. And then、uh, this just this fascinating story about at the end of the war, 1946,、uh, you、uh, were given orders to return to the U.S., but you had become enamored of the revolutionary movement in China. You decided to stay behind, and you walked. I think, if I remember from your book, you walked 500 miles to the caves in Yan'an, where. Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai and General Chu Da and the entire leadership of the Chinese Communist Party were holed up in the in the, in the mountains, defending themselves against the Nationalist Army. And you decided to cast your lot with them and support the People's Revolution. And I guess、uh, in, uh, perhaps Sarah Palin might say you decided to hang around with communists. I deny it. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to, you know, what did you imagine was going to be the outcome of that? Incredible decision for a 25-year-old man at the end of World War II. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I didn't think that far into the future. I just felt they told me, the the Chinese leaders, the communist leaders told me, what we really need here is someone with English as their mother tongue to help us present our policies to America,、mm -hmm. because they said Americans in China. Whether diplomats or military, they basically understand our policy, but Americans in Washington do not.、Mm -hmm. And we want to get that message over in good English.、Mm -hmm. So we need somebody. So I thought, boy, I'm fulfilling a need here,、mm -hmm. a historical need. I mean, this is the most populous country in the world, most aged country in the world, and they're in the process of reinventing themselves. China is rising, new China, and I'm able to be a cog in this wheel. So I was just carried away by the, by by the joy of being able to fulfill this kind of mission. Well, I remember you used the term. You felt that you had your finger on the pulse of history there. That's right, finger on the pulse of history. And also remember reading that、uh, you communicated several messages from Mao to the U.S. government. Uh, about his interest in establishing a close and friendly relationship with the United States, but those messages were rejected. Twice in 1946. Once was to an American military representative, General Marshall's adjutant, and once was to 
one of the American consuls in Beijing, in the, in the consulate. Same message, uh, Mao said, after we come to power in China, we want good relations with the United States. We know you're supporting the nationalists against us, but after we come, we want good relations for two reasons. Reason one, because we're gonna need loan money to rebuild our country. China has been torn by constant warfare for over 100 years. Everything's a wreck. Everything needs to be built. And after World War II, only America has that kind of money. And we're not asking for a handout. We have gold. We can pay at the going rates of international interest. This did not surprise me. But his second reason really surprised me. He said the second reason is, after the war, we do not want to be unilaterally dependent on the Soviet Union. We want to be able to deal with both the East and the West because the Soviets are communists, we're communists, but we have our own viewpoint, and on many basic viewpoints, we don't agree with them. So we like, but uh, you know, people don't realize our folks that run foreign policy in Washington tend to be very much ideologues, mm. whereas the Chinese are highly pragmatic. They just want to do business. Mm. And we have this problem right up to the present day. Mm -hmm. so, so you're in the inner sanctum in this, uh, this small group of people leading the revolution in China. You become a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you're, you're a trusted foreign advisor. <clears throat> you're helping to broadcast uh, over uh, uh, Beijing radio uh, the message from the People's Revolution. And all of a sudden, three years later, that comes crashing down when uh, I think, as you told me, uh, uh, Joe Stalin sent a communique to Mao Zedong accusing you of being an American spy. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, what happened was <laughs> that uh, I was suddenly arrested and uh, locked up in a pitch black dark cell for one year and interrogated for the first few months. And then... The interrogation slowed down, but uh, I was given some kind of drugs, mm -hmm. two little pills three times a day, probably some kind of amphetamine, mm -hmm. which makes you very excited and keeps you from sleeping. Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to break down and confess. Mm -hmm. So I broke down, but I had nothing to confess. <laughs> so it's kind of awkward. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is, really. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't just make something up, of course, but, uh, yeah. You, you yeah. can't make something yeah. up without involving other people. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Um, so if I have any advice over, over you good folks, I would say, carry something, some little guilt around with you. <laughs> yeah. That if you have to confess one day, okay, here it is. Here it is. Know, yeah. Something yeah. relatively harmless. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I broke down and lived this nightmarish, hysterical existence with hallucinations and so on for, I don't know exactly how long, probably three or four months, mm -hmm. maybe a little longer. But I knew all along that this was not me, mm -hmm. that I was sick. And I was climbing, 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 trying to climb out of it mm -hmm. every day. And I had a basic article of faith in my mind this business of uh, psychological problems, my code word for it was Freud. I never read Freud, really know nothing about Freud, but to me, this was Freud. If, if you're locked up alone, all your, all your urges are repressed, you know, you're gonna go bonkers. And on the other side was just plain old reason, you know, just plain old sense. Mm -hmm. Analyze the picture, figure out what to do in these circumstances, mm -hmm. and do it. Mm -hmm. And I had this basic confidence that reason can triumph over this Freud business. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it turned out to be true. Yeah. <laughs> reason works. Reason works, yeah. it does. Another, another thing you mentioned as a, a, a savior 
uh, during your incarceration, especially the first one when you were in, in dark solitary confinement, was your lifelong love of poetry that you studied when you were a student at uh, Chapel Hill. Very much Tell so. us about that. Oh, because, yeah, I always loved poetry. Um, sorry, in Charleston, South Carolina, we call it poetry, <laughs> and not poetry. But anyway, um, it was amazing. I still don't understand it to this day. <clears throat> On the day in which I was suddenly shocked by being arrested and being accused of being a spy, because I really loved them with all my heart, mm -hmm. loved the idea of the people's revolution. How could they think I was a, an enemy? Mm -hmm. And as they led me across to the pitch black cell, four lines popped into my head automatically that I was very sickly as a little boy, you know. I never thought I'd live to be 50. Um, and my sister, my Aunt Nell, used to read poetry to me. And one of the poems they read, but I never really memorized, was by Edwin Markham, and it went like this. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. And I thought, God, where does that come from? But now that's the plan, really. I have to show them by how I behave who I really am, mm -hmm. and eventually they'll see, eventually they'll be convinced. Mm. So, and then there was this wonderful uh, lines from Shelley, Prometheus Unbound, about uh, hope till hope creates from its own wreck, that thing it contemplates, about the strength of freedom, and, um, and, and a number of other poems that, you know, when you're, when you're thinking head, when you're under heavy pressure, third degree, and you're not thinking very clearly, these things are ready-made. Mm -hmm. They just pop up. Also, yes. great fairy stories. Mm -hmm. Great fairy stories. Great fairy stories. There were fairy stories that the most important one was about a little boy who was very, very selfish. And he, he didn't like other kids to play with his toys. He had everything as hard as I. He didn't, didn't want anybody to play with his toys. So one day his fairy godmother granted his wish, which was, I want to be in a place where I have everything my heart desires, but no other kids can come there. So he finds himself in a magic castle. The walls of the castle are one half mirrors and one half windows, open windows. So he has these beautiful clothes, he dresses up, he preens himself, he has all kinds of goodies to eat, and he's on top of the world. He, he's looking in the mirrors, he's admiring himself. But you know, it begins to pall on him after a few days. He begins to feel lonely and isolated. Oh no, first, first, I have to tell it right, first, he... he sings about how wonderful it is to be here with all this riches by himself. And as he does it, the mirrors in the wall expand and the windows contract. So finally, after self-adulation like this, no more windows, only mirrors. And he says, fine, after all, I only, I only enjoy seeing myself anyway. Mm -hmm. Then it gets lonesome. Mm. And he starts begging fairy godmother, open the windows, no soap. Then a little bird somehow got into the castle and one of the bird's wings was broken. And it was broken, the bird's way up high on, on, on a rod somewhere. And he begins to feel something brand new, sympathy. He begins to feel sympathy for this bird and he piles up chairs, kind of dangerous, gets up there, finds a bird, brings it down, makes a splint for the wing, wing, and the wind is open about half a foot wide. Then he goes over and he says, well, I can't get my freedom, but at least 
I can give you your freedom. He puts the bird outside, and the window's open again. Mm. That's the story. Mm. So that's a mechanism that will carry you through anything. Mm. If all there is is me, you're sunk. Mm. You're not only sunk in solitary. You, you're sunk anywhere, only you don't know it. Mm. Mm. You know, if all Simply there is is me. Is what keeps exactly, me. exactly, yeah. exactly. You're a card kind. It, and what I found after I got back to America, I went to the New York Public Library to the experts on fairy tales, mm -hmm. and I found out <laughs> it seems there is no such fairy tale. I made it up out of my <laughs> head. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So after six years of reciting poetry and fairy tales in the dark, you were released and you went back to being a revolutionary as, as uh, you're pictured here. And during this period of time is when you met Yulin, uh, which uh, probably was the most important catalyst in your long uh, experience in China. So tell us a little, little bit about that and then I want to finish up with, with your recommendations and advice for yeah. people on how yeah. to well, get that I mean, Sydney elixir. Well, I'm sure, you know, many different times in my life I've, I've benefited by not listening to the common wisdom, to the conventional wisdom, but doing what a little voice in my head says you should do. So I was told, this 23-year-old girl with long pigtails, and I knew if I could convince this girl to marry me, it would make my life. But my friends all said, do not reveal your feelings or she'll cut you off because she's very career-oriented. She cuts everyone off. Whatever you do, do not write her a love letter. So I thought that was a good advice, and that night I went back to the office and wrote her a letter <laughs> and laid it all out. Right, of course. And it worked. And how many years have you been married now? 56. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's going to work? <laughs> Well, when I uh, first met Sydney, uh, around about 1993 or 94, I suppose, and made a couple of visits to China with Sydney, which is, I think, like traveling with Marco Polo and Henry Kissinger and uh, such, um, I, I, I found it hard to believe that someone who has gone through that kind of incredible ordeal would be, without a doubt, the most upbeat and optimistic person that I've ever met. So how can that horrible, terrible, uh, ordeal that you went through, how could you bottle that up and give it away to other people so that they wouldn't have to spend 16 years in solitary confinement in order to discover what's really important in life? Yeah, because it was really, I mean, I hate to be a whiner, but I, I thought it was too, <laughs> yeah, it was too long. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what I would say is several things. First, have confidence in yourself have confidence in your ability to analyze, to figure out a situation, however bad or complicated, and figure out the way forward. Have confidence in your ability to assess your own strong points and weak points, and use your own strong points to deal with your weak points. You're the only one that can deal with your weaknesses, and you can do it, and that's the way you grow. And I would also say, Everything bad that happens to us is an opportunity to learn and to make progress. So we should try to get something good out of everything bad, no matter how terrible. And on the other hand, we have to be careful that a good thing doesn't turn into a bad thing. Mm. A runner that's highly trained, self-confident, if that self-confidence turns into arrogance, then you're sunk. You don't train properly. So we all are a lot stronger than we think we are, believe me. We really are. I think so, too. Yeah. That's it. That's it.